spite of all the improvements that have taken place over many, many years to make it. But just driving down that avenue of trees there, under the bridge, up into the Ascari chicane, the quick left, then the right, then the left onto the back straight, which leads down to the infamous Parabolica corner. All names that well, I grew up as a child with, and uh, that's only about a 10, 15 years ago. He said in an honest voice. Uh, and the circuit, this is one corner, the Parabolica remaining unchanged, pretty much, from however it was, the runoff areas perhaps look a little different, but that shot is one of the great classic Monza shots, isn't it, looking at the straight? It's just iconic. I mean, yeah. it sums up Monza. One photograph, you know which racetrack it is, you know the part of the racetrack, you know where the corner that follows the straight is, you know the name of the corner. It's just all about Monza, and again, now onto the front straight, going past the old tribunes. They were built back in the 20s when this circuit was originally created in the Mon Royal Monza Park just outside Milan and literally on the doorstep of the, the town. May have been a village back in the 20s of Monza. And still the pit lane empties as cars come streaming through at the end of an outlap. So this session is perhaps the least of the relevant because you don't have everybody in it and with the cars being heavy, this is where you put out your slower driver or your less experienced driver. Everybody has to go out in one element of qualifying. You can't just elect to park the car, you have to go out there. There, looking to try to gain track position, one of the new shapes, the new brands into Blanc Pain this year. It is the Bentley, and car eight for the first part of qualifying uh, is going to be hustled along by Duncan Tappy. Good to have him back in the championship. And the Bentley dwarfing the smaller BMW in front. Well, it's like a giant card looking to swallow up some little minnow. I mean, <laughs> with that large air intake in the front, you can just imagine his jaws opening up and just engulfing the BMW, but quite... Can't quite get the job done into the second chicane, but great to have two of these Bentleys competing in, in the Blanc Pain Endurance Series this season. And Duncan Tappy getting a little bit impatient coming into Lesmo 1, saying, get out of my way, I'm quicker than you. I want some clear track space. Duncan runs a little bit wide ahead of him. The BMW is one of those run by TDS, the French team. Uh, and the car of Henry Hassid and Nick Katzberg spent most of pre-qualifying out of the session, in fact. It ran through the gravel early on, and that was pretty much the last we saw. We had a very badly damaged Ferrari in pre-qualifying. Dennis Anderson, the Dane, crashed his car. Question mark as to whether we're going to see that, and I suspect we are not, even though it would not be in this first part of qualifying. It's a two-driver entry. Still some doubt as to whether that will run again today, even if for the race tomorrow. And one car we have lost is the Jaguar, the Emil Frey Jaguar. That's got a mechanical problem, as often it has, and ran yesterday second quickest in the bronze test, but we've seen the last of that, sad to say. Now, still, Duncan Tappy can't find a way through and get past the BMW, which sort of illustrates, in a way, how the balance of performance works. Indeed it does, and we mentioned earlier in the broadcast that the BMW suffers on a circuit like Monza. It is a high downforce. GT car as opposed to some of the others and uh, the, the, the Bentley is struggling to keep up it's certainly what is clear is the BMW is marginally quicker now the Bentley gets the slipstream the draft on the inside into the first chicane the, ben the benefit the BMW has it's got more downforce so therefore it's quicker in a corner the Bentley's got a little bit less downforce so slower in a corner but eventually the top speed gets the Bentley alongside down the inside into the first chicane and so now Duncan Tappy can press on. Uh, times, as I say, are perhaps not that relevant in Q1, but at the moment the quickest is Mark Schulzitzki's Nissan. He's done a 150.6 uh, from second fastest, 55, which is Frankie Cheng. Uh, there, number 44, Aston Martin, being hustled on by Stephen Jelly in the first part of qualifying, which is interesting. Stephen, I would propose, is the faster of the three drivers in that car, but he's been sent out first in the motor base run, Aston Martin. I suppose maybe doing so enables Stephen, the most experienced of the drivers in these cars, to assess where the car is in terms of its lap time and its handling before he hands over to the slightly less experienced teammates. Just as a point of interest, the quickest lap overall in pre-qualifying practice earlier today was by, no surprise, Laurence Van Thor in the Belgium RD Club WRT RDR8. That was a 1 minute 48.002. Right now we're still in the middle 150s with Mark Shulitsky in the Nissan, a 150.6. Now, motor base of tricksters, they nominated Stephen Jelly for the session, they sent out Michael Kane, try and peer into a cockpit and spot a crash helmet to confirm that, but Michael Kane is being shown as the driver in that car, although the original list had Stephen Jelly. Michael Kane is no slouch, bear in mind, former British GT champion, the Cambridge car dealer, 
and very, very quick. He's perhaps one of the quickest amateurs out there. By amateur, I mean somebody who has a day job as well as racing cars. But uh, Michael, who's raced at Le Mans, Carrera Cup champion, began in road saloons, very quick driver indeed. Castellacci in the Ferrari, I think it is. Gone quickest overall, um, a small improvement, only by about two or three tenths, 150.307. And second fastest is currently James Nash, new to GT racing. The last time he raced a rear-wheel drive car was in his Formula Ford C-Tec days. Uh, sorry, Formula Ford uh, Duratec days. He's second, then it is Frankie Cheng, then Mark Szczytski, and up to fifth fastest now is cab number 11, which is the Polish Ferrari driver, Mikhail Brovniewski. And then sixth fastest is the first of the Mercedes. Actually, Mercedes, you've got six and seven. Harold Primat also going strongly at the moment. This session will have a further eight minutes, give or take. Again, you can see the perils of traffic there. Frankie Cheng in the Audi, desperately trying to wriggle his way through in the background. Triple one, which is the Kessel Racing Ferrari of the American driver, Stephen Earle. That's one of the quick cars in the Gentleman Trophy. Well worth watching that come Sunday afternoon in the Gentleman Trophy. Yeah, they were all on the way down to 22nd at the end of that free qualifying practice session. But, of course, the times in that session and with the introduction of a limited number of tyres and reduction from seven sets last year to five sets this year, not a car stopped midway down on the right-hand side of the, the, the return straight from the Ascari chicane down to Parabolica as the McLaren exits. 26 is the Santa Lock. Audi. Uh, Greg Gilver, a regular Santalot driver, but they've also got Stefan Ortelli in the car. Uh, Greg Gilver is in fact now second fastest. Stefan Ortelli for this championship, not with WRT. Uh, Audi did a bit of shuffling of its drivers and at one point Stefan had no drive at all for Blanc Pan, but in the last few days has fetched up at Santalot. Whether he will do the whole season is still up for discussion apparently. Well, certainly I mean, Stefan Ortelli has enjoyed huge success with the Audi team in its various guises. And he's the kind of driver that you would like to have in your car. Occasionally he does sort of do things that are a little irrational, but mm. he's so entertaining and he's such a consistent, ultimately uh, professional driver that even though this is not a WRT Audi, it is a, to all intents and purposes an identical car, and I'm sure the level of preparation is at the same standard. Yeah, I think he'll be one to keep an eye to, certainly, Stefan Ortelli. But Greg Gilver, young French driver, we saw a couple of years ago very quick on occasions. And the Santa Lot car then, second fastest it was, it's now down to third. Castellacci has gone top in this session, ahead of Brozniewski. New to block Pan, Michal Brozniewski, the pole, but he's going well. Can we get the pole on pole? That I doubt, but it's possible in this element of qualifying. Greg Gilver comes through, goes quickest of all into the 49s now. 149.546. So first car to break the 150s. Interesting again, that session we saw earlier today, top four cars, three of them were Ferrari 458s. Now, whether they can repeat that, level of performance here at Monza, which is, of course, the emotional home of Ferrari. We have to wait to see, but Sinti Castellacci, quickest initially now, having been overtaken by the ID. Now, we're talking about Greg Gilver, but the team is being asked to check the transponder, so I just wonder whether uh, it's not Gilver. It could be Stefan Ortelli after all, but I would have thought they'd have put Stefan out in Q3 when the car was at its lightest. Transponders being in the wrong place remains a problem for teams seemingly in this championship. The Team Parker Racing Audi there, ducked out of the way, hops back in again, that's the Ian Loggy, Chris Jones, Julian Westwood car. There, WRT with the track to itself. That's what he would be looking for, nice, clear air, no pressure, certainly not from behind, and uh, just all you have to do is look down the road. Uh, let's have a look and see what... Says our okay, Ramos, Cesar Ramos not yet done a time, this is his first flying lap, so John, talk us round this. Well, into Lesmo 1. Slight change to the corner from many days ago, and, but principally Lesmo 2 much slower than it used to be. Easy to overrun the corner on the exit. In fact, we saw the Ferrari this morning do that very thing and then spear literally almost 90 degrees off to the right and into the Tech Pro barriers, which protected the driver but did a lot of damage to the front of the Ferrari. Under the bridge, up into the first of the three proper corners that comprise the Ascari chicane. Good speed through the corner, and then that final exit Careful not to overrun the curb. They put little extra speed humps on the inside of the exit of turn three in the Ascari chicane to stop drivers simply just shortcutting the corner. Then the run down to Parabolica, great corner, hard on the brakes. Then early apex, let the car then float 
literally all the way out to the outside of the corner, making sure you don't overrun the exit too early, and then it's just straighten the car up, free it up, and then just get as much straight line speed as you can. One minute, 50.3 for Cesar Ramos. And that's sixth fastest, so not a bad effort. And now, ideally, they want to park that and save life in this set of tyres, don't they? You would think so, but, you know, he may get one more time lap just to get his eye in. Uh, I mean, it's a while since they've been in these cars, and again, everything does change, primarily the circuit changes. There's been a couple of events prior, or sorry, since these cars were last out on track in a Mercedes, and is that damage to the front of the car, or is it just something fluttering at the front of the Mercedes? It's certainly something, isn't there? Something is fluttering. I wonder whether the windscreen may have popped. Well, it, it's, it's like maybe one of the tear-offs in the windscreen. Yeah. But uh, oh, there's, there's a bit of drive still, but uh, I think he's been advised, shut the engine down, we're going to tow you off the circuit. And uh, that is the end of the session for you. Let's have a look and see again. Yes, into the Parabolica. It's caught out a few people today. To Normally it's not a corner you expect. It's not a difficult corner. The difficulty is just getting your judgment as to where you break, and if you break too late, then maybe the shift from, front, uh, from rear to front just catches the back end of the car right. But again, something... At the, on the, yeah. Like the windscreen tear off. And that is Harold Primat, who is an experienced racer. That's last year's champion's car, Max Boot's car, that Harold Primat's plonked in the gravel. So okay. that's. I think, uh, now let's reset what we've just talked about, because you wouldn't expect a driver of his experience and skill to get caught out. So maybe what we are seeing fluttering around the front of the windscreen may have been something that distracted yeah, Primat. Sure. So yeah. we wait to see. So that car is out of the session, which hasn't got long to go, as you can see, just under two minutes. And working their way through traffic, McLaren's take on Ferrari. Now there, the Nissan 35 that's been booming its way through in the hands of Marshall Zitzke. That's now fifth and third in Pro-Am. Same class structure as before, remember, the Pro Cup, the Pro-Am Cup and the Gentleman Trophy. And the Bob Neville run cars are going to be as competitive as ever, that's for sure. 35, Marshall Zitzke uh, has for company, Miguel Fascia and Katsumasa Chio. Uh, Chio will do Q3. He's on this Nissan Driver Exchange program. So Lucas Ordonez has gone to Japan to race in Super GT and Europe gains uh, Chio for this season. Shulzitsky bails out of the session, done his bit, saved the tyres at least one more lap. Big difference is racing Super GT in Japan is the, those cars have got tons, tons of downforce and a lot of horsepower as well. They're very, very quick cars run Japanese circuits. Mm. To come to Europe with a car with a lot less downforce, but probably not a huge amount of difference in horsepower, will be a little bit of an eye-opening experience. <laughs> and here Greg Gilbert still pounds on, fastest in this element of qualifying session. And now, with more and more people heading for the pits, he gets the road to himself, of course. Now, when we talked about the transponders a little while ago being in the wrong place, um, the team have confirmed that, yes, the transponder is in the wrong place and Edward Sandstrom is doing the time. Greg Gilver was nominated for Q1, but they've uh, put Edward Sandstrom in the car and so Edward Sandstrom is the fastest and we get that just as he pits and now Greg Gilver can get on board. And it's Greg Gilver who confirmed it, so if he's able to tell people in the pits, that pretty much does back up he's not in the car. So What is the point of having transponders if the team doesn't connect the right exactly. transponder to exactly. the right driver name? Uh, makes our life a lot more easy if they would do that, and uh, makes us look, you know, giving one driver credit for doing a good job when it's Edward Sandstrom, who actually has done the good job, quickest in the session one, 49.2. Seven or six tenths of a second quicker than Francesco Castellacci in the first of the Ferraris. And then third, Frankie Cheng, which is a good effort, good effort in the Audi. Yeah. And that was a car that caused a red flag early on in the day, not in his hands, granted, but when it had a spin, uh, the car couldn't rejoin. Michael Brosniewski, fourth, assuming it is he now, there's doubt in our minds, uh, a good effort. And uh, we'll run through the top times in a moment from that session. Again, Bra Bra I can't even pronounce his name. Bronskayeski, whatever it is, is uh, again another of the Ferrari 458 drivers. Which is, historically, Monza's been kind to Ferraris, hasn't it? Won outright. In fact, won all three classes last year here, didn't it? The Ferrari 458. Yeah, it's a circuit that you would expect them to be strong on, and um, those fans that will be coming here tomorrow are not likely to be cheering for anything other than. Ferrari for victory. So the flag is out, and Harold Primat, who we saw go off before he went off, had actually improved his time. He did a 
50 to get himself up into the top nine. Just ahead of the Gilles Vanillet driven Ferrari. We'd love to know what happened to Primat with the Mercedes because we only really caught the tail end of the of the off down at Parabolica. But we did notice something that was flapping around the windscreen area. And cars do carry loads of tear offs on their windscreens. Can't imagine something like that would have caused the distraction, but hopefully we'll get that news a bit later. Now let's catch up with one or two uh, news stories from Q1. Edward Sandstrom, as we now know, did the time. So let's hear from the Swedish driver, Edward Sandstrom, is with Jack Nichols. Thank you, Edward. So, uh, sorry that uh, you can't get your drink. Oh, we'll, let you, no. we'll let you go in a minute. We'll let you go in a minute. No, no pictures. You look beautiful. Um, a good time for the car. It's looking strong. Yeah, I mean, I arrived here Friday. I got to know I'm going to drive uh, on the Thursday evening. And uh, I showed up, and it's a great team. It's a great car. It's an, an Audi that's fast at Monza. And, uh, yeah, I can't be more happy than being first in the first qualifying. But it's a long way to go, and now I hope... Uh, both uh, Stefan and, and Greg can uh, yeah, achieve even better times because we will need it for sure. Is that unusual because we saw Audi's a little slow in a straight line last year? Yeah, but I mean, maybe they've changed the BOP a bit, but still it's a good balance in the car at the moment and that plays a, a big role to catch a lap time here, even if you have to have top speed, but you can also adjust uh, things on the car to try to achieve more top speed. So we work on that and we try our best. Cool, thanks Edward, go get a drink. And uh, just to avoid confusion, chaps, it's uh, Stefan Ortelli who's in the 26 Santa Lock Audi next. Okay, Jack, thanks for that. Your next task, if you have a chance to go talk to him, is to ask him about um, improving his lap time under a yellow flag because that car is under investigation after Q1 for improving under yellow. So the story may not have ended there just yet. No, no, no. the other story I would like to know is what happened to the Mercedes of Harold Priamat when it went off in Parabolica? Uh, if there was an issue with the windscreen, which is a very odd thing to, to find out, but certainly there was something flapping uh, on the front end of the car as it went through the gravel trap. Just looking down into the pit lane to see whether the car has been brought back. I think it has, so the team is hard at work, and Q2 will get underway very shortly. Another 15 minutes, one or two drivers making their way down towards the end of the pit lane. Now, uh, John, it's going to get even busier now. It's a bit of a traffic jam to begin with, but now you throw in all the two driver cars as well, so Finding that clear bit of track space is even more important. Yes, and that's where Edward Sandstrom was talking about having a good car, a car that's comfortable to drive, a car that's got a good balance. And it's not essential uh, in terms of maybe getting the ultimate lap time. Sometimes an edgy car for a single flying lap on a fresh set of tyres will be actually quicker. What he's talking about, he's got a really good car that he can drive and rely on and it is, con it is consistent in the way it gives feedback to the driver. It's a good race car. I think that's what Edward Sandstrom was saying, more than, let's say, it's an out not hot rod, which there will be people in the pit lane who will have a car that will be a one-lap special. They may get a slightly higher position on the grid. But when it comes to driving in a race, you want a car that is with you, it's consistent, not one that's constantly changing from being all on the front end, then suddenly losing the front end, the balance goes. To me, balance is everything even more important, I believe, than downforce. So let's now see what Stefan Rotelli can do in that Audi. It should go quicker in as much as it will be a bit lighter. Uh, you can't refuel the car, so in other words, the fuel load keeps on coming down as you go through the sessions. And at the moment, a 149.260 is the time to beat, uh, thanks to Edward Sandstrom. And we'll see in a few moments whether that is going to be bettered. And the session will be live very, very shortly. We've talked about some of the uh, new drivers. We've talked about the new Bentley that's coming to the championship. Uh, they would have been a Camaro run by the writer team, but that had engine dramas in the week on the dyno. And so uh, the team has pressed into service one of its successful Lamborghinis for the purposes of the weekend. And Albert von Turn on Texas, Peter Cox, and Thomas Engel, the three drivers. So that will be a quick car for sure and looking down to the pit lane 25 Santa Lock Audi is on its way that's the car that Jean-Claude Lanier Claudie Gosselin and Mark Sword share the sister car it runs at the Gentleman Trophy but it's out of the same operation Santa Lock Racing as the 
Uh, Edward Sandstrom car that we've just been talking about. In the background, I think you can see the Lamborghini that we've just been talking about, and as everybody else makes their way down the pit lane, Aston Martin, run by the Omar Racing Team, the two Bentleys, sitting up on their stilts, ready to go. Good to have the Bentley name. The cars run by M Sport, Malcolm Wilson's team, with huge success in the World Rally Championship, and all the guys working on the cars are from his rally program. There aren't any new people brought in with pure circuit racing experience. If you've got people on the pay Old, you work them hard in Cumbria, so that's what Malcolm Wilson has elected to do. Although I suspect many of the engineers are quite enjoying being on a hard standing pit lane at a nice, bright, hot, and sunny circuit rather than a big puddle in a Welsh forest. Yeah, very much so. And I think if you, you've got good people, as Malcolm Wilson has with his M Sport team, the only question mark I have is why does he want to have it based up in Cumbria? <laughs> Beautiful part of the world, the Lake District, and all that. Good rally country. But it is a zillion miles from you know, the Channel ports. But anyway. Yeah, true. They have got a, a very well-engineered car. I had a look at it this morning. I think it's superbly engineered. And I'm looking forward to see Bentley enjoying some success with their entry into the Blanc Pass series. It's the best thing about Cockham now, is Sport. That's where they're based, up in the Lake District. So, out they pour from the pit lane. The session goes live as the cars then head onto the circuit with the Ferrari, Audi, McLaren, Aston Martin, BMW, long, long line, Mercedes as well. In fact, the uh, black and green car you can see that comes out of the Black Falcon team, Hubert Haupt, Abdulaziz Al Faisal, and Andreas Simonson, the drivers. There is WRT's 2014 Blanc Pan Endurance lineup. Car four, thinking, why has that got a different looking number, as in it's on a red background? Well, that's because it's a gentleman trophy car. We haven't seen WRT run gentleman trophies cars before. Christian Kelders, successful in that class, is one driver. Jean-Luc Blanchemin, the reigning champion, is another. And the third is Yves Vietz, who is the man who put some of the money up to start the team. Yeah, uh, you could probably could sum up what you've said by just saying, ka-ching, ka-ching, <laughs> ka-ching. You know, even the, the great and the wonderful have to look ultimately to we're in a business, we've got to make a, not a profit, we've got to make the business viable. And, and if that's the way you make it viable, what's wrong? Absolutely. And it's also healthy to yeah. see gentlemen drivers in such well-prepared cars as the WRT Audis. I think it's going to bring something extra to that class this year. It's going to give tougher opposition. Now, uh, number 10 BMW, the Eric Clement, Benjamin Lariche, Nicola Armindo car is on track. In theory, it should be uh, Benjamin Lariche behind the wheel of it. It is according to the timing screen. And in the background, for the first time, you can see the sister car, the third of those cars on screen, uh, Henry Hasid at the wheel of it. In the middle is the Acuria Cos BMW, uh, which has got Alistair McCaig at the wheel. It's Alistair's dad, Hugh McCaig, who these days is Acuria Cos, effectively. And the Nick Katzberg, Henry Hasid BMW slots in behind as the uh, cars then work their way up now towards the timing line. We can feel the vibrations of that BMW V8 engine right up in the commentary booth. It is it's great. It, it gives it this a real V8 throaty roar. Nick Katz, sorry, Henry has seen in the background. It is looking all heroic to get past Alison McKay coming into the chicane. Did it work? Yes, it did. There he is. Yep. Gains track position. And still, as these guys are on their first flying lap, others are pouring out of the pit lane. So Monza is just awash with cars. Well, you, you never know what the best deal is when the pit lane opens. Do you want to be at the head of the pit lane knowing? That by the time you complete your out lap and about to go on to your first flying lap, you're going to meet traffic that's still filtering onto the track from the pit lane. It's a lottery. All you can do is go out and do the best you can. At least we're seeing somebody has got the fastest sector time. Naturally, it's going to be the, probably one of the first cars out. It's changing almost car by car at the moment. It's claimed by Alessandro Bonaccini in the Ferrari that Michael Brozniewski drove in the earlier part of the session. Just thinking about Ferraris, there's no sign of the Danish Ferrari, so it's still, I think, being repaired, if at all. Hopefully the car will be on the grid for tomorrow, will be from the back. So, how many time laps are you going to get out of this? Seven at the most, I would have thought. Let's uh, try and catch up on one or two more things from the pits, as they say. Jack, what news? Breaking too late, back end got away and they ended up in the gravel trap. And in general, the Mercedes teams aren't particularly optimistic for qualifying. They're saying it suits the, the Ferraris and the McLarens a lot more. So Mercedes teams getting in the excuses quite early on this weekend. We missed the start of what you said, Jack, but from what we did pick up, it was Harold Primat's own mistake, is that right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. OK, and no damage to the car, I take it? No, they're just getting rid of all the gravel at the moment from, uh, from underneath it and 
scraping around, but no actual damage to the machine. Well, that's the good news. Thanks for that, Jack. OK, interesting to know, then. Mistake. Yeah, I mean, we were trying to make excuses yeah. for how we mad, believing that there was something that caused a distraction to cause him to make a mistake coming into Parabolica, but looks like he just puts his hands up and said, I got it wrong. Of course, the gravel gets everywhere in a car, and when it's being pulled out in particular, you know, you're just dragging it with you, and um, apart from anything else, it gets then dragged onto the racetrack. Hopefully, the car would have been pulled away from the actual racing line before it managed to get back onto track to get back to the pits. We've had one up the escape road, and it's Kevin Est who uh, starred at the end of last year in Azerbaijan. There is the very quick Bonaccini Ferrari, Alessandro Bonaccini, a good Italian GT racer, bouncing over the kerb. Yeah, but right now it's Simon Knapp and the other Ferrari, of course, so who's gone quickest and a 149.7, which is again half a second or so slower than the time from the ID, 149.2. We're not seeing anything approaching the times we saw earlier today with a 48.002 at the minute. Another car that's been up the escape road at the same place is the other ART uh, McLaren, Alexandra Prema. So ART have got their own line through the first chicane. Uh, it's not yet helping in terms of time. Stefano Guy has just gone quickest for Ferrari at 49.205, quicker then than Edward Sandstrom went in Q1. Yep. And there's a very slow WRT Audi that has just lipped past the pits. It's the Gentleman Trophy entry, the number four car that has got Christian Kelders at the wheel of it, but that car has ground to a halt. It's going to bring out a yellow flag on the pit straight. Well, that's a disappointment as well as a surprise. And Marshall running down to the end of the pit lane to try and maybe retrieve that car, but walking away, the car hopefully is in a sufficiently safe place. Let's look and see. You couldn't get a really good glimpse looking down the pit straight to see where that Audi has gone to. As it, I don't know where it's gone to. I think it's picked up again, hasn't oh, it? No, no, it is not. Yeah. Creeping through the first chicane, literally. And uh, what the reason for this is, it's almost, it's not, it's a bit quicker than limp home mode. Mm. Maybe just simply lack of familiarity with the car. What's happening up at Descari as the Ferrari comes through? A little bit of curb at the, oh yeah, aggressive Careful. use. You're not really meant to be using that. That's exceeding the circuit limits in my book. And on that lap, Alessandro Bonaccini went fastest, incidentally. Number Four. 44, Aston Martin, Ahmad Ahati at the wheel of it, the Omani driver. Carries the colours of Oman and its uh, tourist board. And it's an attractive car anyway, the Aston Martin. And Motorbase, a team with... Do you think so? I think it's an attractive car, that. Wouldn't mind having one. I'd rather have one with an engine in the boot, like a Porsche. <laughs> oh, yes, have we seen your Porsches yet? <laughs> no, we haven't. Yet, no. <laughs> Alessandro Bonaccini, by the way, has actually blitzed the quickest lap so far in qualifying with a 48.6, which is really what, the best part of four tenths of a second quicker, five tenths of a second quicker than we've seen so far in these two qualifying sessions. So Ferrari, again, to the fore. Kevin Est had gone third, quickest now has been by... Uh, if a critical guy, Stefano Guy, Stefano guy yeah. got second, so it's Ferrari's one and two. Now, the Aston Martin, the motor base run car team, if you follow touring car racing, you'll be familiar with. Uh, Ahmad Al Hafi goes over the line and goes seven fastest, so the Armani driver going strongly. Next single seater turned Carrera Cup racer, now Aston Martin racer. There are some Porsches in this, I mentioned this because John likes Porsches, but there's not, I'm afraid, a great many of them, only two in the entry, which is a real surprise this year. It is a surprise, a huge disappointment, of course. But we've got these two Bentleys coming, and of course, right now, in almost just a, a, an unsponsored car, there are sponsors on the car. Uh, name them if you can, and I know that's a trick question I've asked you, David, three times today, <laughs> and once you hadn't a clue, but the other time, you sort of, you knew what I was talking about. We'll come back to Bentley in a minute. Let's go back to the pits. Jack, what have you got for us? Trouble for the number 80 Nissan, unfortunately. The RJN crew are working on the car in the pit lane at the moment because if you work on the car in the pit lane, then you can continue to compete in qualifying. But Bob Neville just told me it doesn't look good because one of the turbo pipes has come off, which has uh, stranded the car of uh, Strauss and Bunkham and McMillan in the pits with Florian sat in it. So it doesn't look like we'll see the 80 Nissan again unless they can work a miracle, unfortunately. Ooh, a big disappointment. All right, thanks for that, Jack. They were talking about a down on power car early on and they thought they got the problem sorted. Is this a fresh one? Is this a legacy? And either way, it's in the pit lane. And it is Bonaccini from Guy, from Est, from Stippler, from Peter Cox, the top five at the moment. So you've got the Lamborghini up there and you've got the 
top Audi of Stippler and the top McLaren uh, in the hands of Kevin Est. Yeah, but are still the two Ferraris dominating the front row of the grid as we speak. Just under six, under five minutes remaining of the session. And let's just check and see. Well, there's an indication of just how much urgency we're going to see from the Ferrari down into the first chicane. Uh, yet again, incidentally, Santalog are being told about transponders. They're now telling us that Edward Sanson is driving that car. Uh, but thanks to Jack, we know it's Stefan Ortelli, and he's only 10th fastest, although, yeah, Stefan is half a second slower at the moment than Sandstrom was. Number seven, Bentley, has got Guy Smith at the wheel of it, and he's up to fifth fastest. So, Bentley is back. They're well, going very well. That's, that's a good run from Guy Smith. And, uh, you know, Look, I mean, it is a. Look, you can see how large the car is. Now, if you wanted to make it look smaller, paint it black. But, you know, put a bit more sponsorship or associated on the car, and uh, it, it'll lose. It's a big car. Mm. But that's a great performance Absolutely. by Guy Smith to get the car up onto the third rule, provisionally, third rule of the grid. What's fifth when we started talking about him? He's now down to sixth because the Mercedes of Sergei Afanasyev has gone up to fourth fastest. So it's Bonaccini from Guy from Stippler. Afanasyev, Est, and Smith is the top six. And the name high five back. Bentley bounces over the curb. It's a big looking car, but it's a very quick car indeed. And the way that Guy Smith is going, he's done two personal bests in the two sectors he's completed. So there should be, barring traffic and improvement on the cards here, unless the team decides to pull in for the pit lane and save some laps out of the tyres. Let's just talk him over the timing line. He comes out of the Parabolica, the car leans on its suspension. He heads up towards the line. Sixth, he was at the start of the lap. He does stay out, he does go for the timing line, and Guy Smith goes through and goes third fastest. Excellent, excellent run. Very good run indeed by Guy Smith into the 48s with the 48.9. So he, I was thinking he needed to find a quarter of a second to go from sixth to fifth, but he found more than that and he's up to third. And not only that, he's fastest in the Pro Cup because the two Ferraris ahead of Pro-Am. So there's a notional class pole here, Guy. Uh, there's Peter Cox and the Lamborghini Gallardo, which is still howling around. And it is now eighth fastest. In fact, the reason it's eighth is because there's another Bentley seventh. Antoine Leclerc has just gone seventh quickest. So the Bentley boys are doing all right. And this is a Lamborghini, not a Chevy Camaro dressed up as a Lamborghini because <laughs> Ryder had intended to run their Camaro here this weekend. Uh, but they had problems and they then changed the entry, brought the Lamborghini down, and of course Peter Cox's usual face in that car for the Ryder team, uh, as usual, doing a good job. Down and well, he's moved, actually he's dropped to, down to eighth place, yeah. so he's uh, on this lap, three minutes to go in the session, needs to find, what, the best part of a tenth of a second to go up to seventh, needs to find a little bit more to put himself into the top six. The one hero of the session is Stefano Guy, who was racing here last week in the European Ferrari Challenge, but he's the fastest, and he's in the Pro-Am class, don't forget, he's fastest, and he's just done the best of anybody in sector one, so Stefano Guy is doing a great job. Well, we're just sort of jumping around the circuit a little bit, catching up with some of the action as we go back now down to the, back, the bottom of the straight that leads into Parabolica. And there is 88, the writer, Lamborghini, and it looks like it's on its way back into the pits, or is he? Is he? Uh, yes, he is. Yes. Makes the call. Peter Cock fails for the session. Two and a half minutes. I don't think the car will go back out. There's no real need. We've had 36, 37 cars take to the track in this session, and from them, the number four Audi, which had its problem, the Kelders Audi, went back to the pits. It did stagger away again, but only as far as the pit lane. So there's a problem with that WRT car. So I think pretty much everybody who's completed a, a lap they're satisfied with has gone back into the pits and uh, with only just under two minutes now remaining, no chance they're going to be back on track and they're saving tyres, time, whatever. Final drivers will jump in. So Guy Smith that did the time for... It's going to, it's going to be Stephen Kane around. Who, took the, who did the first run in that bent of Guy Smith? Was it Merrick or was it Stephen Kane? I suspect it'll be Stephen Kane who will be in for the third run. I think Andy Merrick did the first stint, I think. I would imagine, because Stephen Kane's most likely to be... Mm. It was going to be either Guy Smith or Stephen Kane that would mm. go second or third, so they opted to put Guy in second, and I'm assuming it's going to be Stephen Kane. So Stephen's been very, very strong indeed in his runs so far in the Bentley, and um, he's got a pretty impressive time to try and match. He's now, that car's now been surpassed. So Guy Smith has dropped down to fourth. Behind the Santa Lock, yeah, and the Stefano Telly in the Santa Lock 
Ardy has now gone to third yeah. quickest. And I was going to mention Stefan because before that lap he was making heavy weather of going as quick as Edward Sanster in Q1, but he's now done the time of 48.8, so he's taken four tenths, as he should have done on a lighter car uh, out of Sandstrom. So it's Stefano Guy from Alessandro Bonaccini, both in Ferraris, both in Pro Am, first and second, or Telly third, topping the Pro Cup from Guy Smith, who's in the pits, Frank Stippler, who is in the pits and Sergei Afanasiev, who is in the pits, they're all in the Pro Cup. And then seventh is this car, the McLaren of Kevin Est, which is not on a quick lap, no. it's been down in the first two sectors. No, he's coming into the pits, he's done his run. Um, whether he's satisfied with it or whether he feels there's more to come, well, we'll not know because he's not going to be in the car for the final session of qualifying, so it should be Andy Suchek. And uh, Andy Suchek finished third here last year, is that right? right yeah. So... Had a good run. A very good run. Strong car, Kevin Est and Sand Andy Suchek. This car is in the Gentleman Trophy. It's the Yannick Malago Jean Marc Bachelier Howard Blank Ferrari, which stopped on track in pre qualifying, but briefly. And it's not a different livery on Ferrari other than just red all the time. How the much the, the livery totally changes the look of that 458, doesn't it? I mean, it makes the front of the car much, much wider looking than it actually is. Now, that in the Gentleman Trophy is fourth in class. That's all telly, but he's on an in lap, yeah. isn't he? He's coming in, so yeah. Stefan has done what he had to do. He's got the car up into third place, and he'll be delighted. There's that familiar, happy smile on the face of Stefan Otelli will return. But there is, which that's the gentleman, WRT Audi, stopped out on the track. That's the exit of Lesmo 2. So that car did have a problem. We saw it creeping around at the beginning of the session, and it's now stopped. So to get that back in time to the pits, let's hope they do so. I had said at one point it had got as far as the pit lane. They've sent it out, and clearly the problem's not sorted, because, as John has just said, it's ground to a halt by the side of the road. That's Santa Locke's gentleman trophy car heading for the pit lane. The Lanier, Gosselin, Mark Seward entry. But Guy Smith, fourth in the Bentley. We were wondering during the course of pre-qualifying whether a win is possible. Podium, I think, is rather more realistic, but it's, it's looking good. I tell you what, I, I'm going to stay completely open-minded about what we can expect from Bentley. First of all, reliability. If they can finish both cars competitively, I think that's a great result. If they can get one of the two cars on the podium, that's a, an even better result. If they can get both cars on the podium, that's a dream. And if they can win the race, well, you know, the rest of the paddock's going to walk away wondering what, what are they going to do. I think having Bentley in the championship is, is a, a great addition. But remember, there are lots of other manufacturers out there, and with the balance of performance, the equalization between the performances of the, the mid-engine, rear-engine, front-engine, mid-engine, whatever, it's all about trying to get the equalization to a point where everybody, in theory, 40 cars that might start the race would all cross the finish line abreast. Wouldn't work, but that's the theory. The top 10 rounded out by Lamborghini, just looking down at some of the brands, but there you can see how the standings are after Q2. So he's got it running and getting the car back. Strange, the car yeah. stopped out on track. Then he's got it fired up again, he can drive it back. To, at least the good news is he's getting it back to the pits so the Absolutely. team can get, you know, literally just plug in the computer and see what the problem is. Well, Stefano Guy has been a real hero in that session. As I say, he was racing here uh, a week ago in the Ferrari Challenge and he was fastest by 17 thousandths of a second in that section of qualifying. Let's hear from Stefano with Jack Nichols. Stefano, great lap, quickest so far. That must be pleasing. Yeah, I, in, uh, in the fastest lap, uh, I did the two mistakes. Uh, we have uh, more, uh, uh, we can do better, but now there is a Q3. Coup, coup it is the important because the car is more performant than uh, Q2. I think Francesco can do uh, better and uh, I want to do a pole position because this is my home race. Uh, I live uh, near Monza and uh, fantastic result for the team, Villorba Corsa, that is the first season in uh, Blampain Endurance Series. Brilliant, thank you. So Stefano Guy, local man, done a great job and so now we get to the really serious bit of qualifying. Your fastest driver the majority of teams will now be behind the wheel. You've got 15 minutes, and with less fuel, the cars should be faster. 
And do you take a gamble and run a fresh set of rubber, or do you think it's more important to keep all the fresh sets you've got for Sunday's race so that you've got the advantage ultimately where it counts, which is going to be in a position where you can make positions? If you're capable of getting into the top 10 and you can do it on a time of used tyres, <clears throat> that's a gamble you might want to take. It's only if you're really in trouble that you might sort of desperate, desperate decision to go on a new set. I mean, most people are going to probably run a, a fresh set of rubber, try and do one timed lap and then take them off. If they want to do any more, well, there's probably not going to be a huge amount of time remaining. So it'll be an out lap. Get on it as hard as you can. Try and position yourself in such a way that you do get that clear lap and then take it back to the pits. With the set scrubbed in, ready for yeah. race day. Nice. Makes sense. One, one heat cycle on the set of tyres, yeah. that's all you want to do. Looking at cars up and down the pit lane, they are ready for changes of tyre. There you can see the Marco Seafried Ferrari ready for its new boots. I wouldn't buy a 458 in that colour. <laughs> I'd just like the money to decide what colour I could have it. The different. It's good to have something other than red Ferraris, I think. Um, well, it's my national colour. I mean, yeah. it's nothing to do with the colour. Yeah. It's just it doesn't work in the shape of the car. <laughs> Tell you what, Marco Seafried made it go quickly though this morning. There is the number three Audi, James Nash, by the door in the white top. James new to GT racing, having moved from the World Touring Car Championship. And Christopher Meese will go in this session. Word of advice to James. I haven't spoken to him, but I might well do so. He's driving for a European-based team. If you're a Brit mm -hmm. and you drive for a European-based team, one of the things that really, really endears you to that team is to learn a few words, whether it's French or Flemish in the case of WRT mm. or maybe just German with the engineers, just to have the ability to walk in in the morning and say, in German, Auf Wiedersehen, Pet, or whatever they say in German. <laughs> <laughs> because if you stick to your home language... Mm you do get a little bit alienated. Mm. And I've seen it time and again. I know British drivers and various forms of motorsport, be it in GT or Group C or even in Formula One. When everything is going well, English can be spoken. When things start to become difficult, everything reverts back to the native language of the team you're driving for. So just having a few words to say, you know, hi, guys, how are you today? You know, what would you do, lad? Just to be able to do that... And then you know, you've done your bit for the day. They all love you. You've made the effort. Makes a big difference. Two thumbs up. Yeah. I'm sure James will factor that in as he uh, spends the year with WRT. And um, I'm sure he doesn't even know what Ovid is in pet is anyway. He's too young. Too young, exactly, yes. <laughs> so the team's hard at work to try and get number four fit and well again. That's the Kelders Blanchemin Wirtz car that we've seen stuck by the side of the road. Bounce on Vols in the background former racer himself in the grey jumper now running this huge and hugely successful Audi operation now the marshals are ready to receive the cars for Q3 there's a long line of them at the end of the pit lane and Q3 will start at 18.05 and that is 40 seconds away so we're almost there and this will sort out the grid so at the moment the best time is that of Stefano Guy a 48.6 can anybody get into the low 48s. What about a high 147 by the end? That might be asking a bit, but we'll no, see. I, I think, I mean, look, we've seen a 48.002 uh, earlier today, again, from an ID from Lawrence Van Thor. We're going to see Van Thor on that car, the number one ID. So he will be looking to improve upon that. And I, I have no reason to doubt that the front row of the grid is going to be somewhere in the 47s, probably maybe the middle to high 47s. But with a light car, with probably the best of tyre available, maybe a new set of tyres, clear track, you've got to be aiming for somewhere in that region. That region. Here we go. Pole position battle starts right here. Assuming the BMW in question from TDS fires up and goes down the pit lane and lets everybody else have a chance of joining in, because at the moment it's stuck. Well, I wonder, maybe the driver has just wandered off. I mean, well, there's a huge traffic jam. The Nissan has to wriggle its way round. Let's have news, Nissan news from Jack. Yes, the number 80 Nissan is just heading out onto the circuit now as the uh, lights go green. So they've done a great job to get them back out. Didn't quite spot who's in the car. I'm just walking up alongside the BMW now just to see if there's any obvious signs of what's gone wrong. The driver uh, is just sort of playing around with the electronics. I think it's Armindo in there. Oh, he's got it going and the BMW's off. 
almost collect an Audi <laughs> on the way out, yes. but we're all good. All right, thanks, Jack. Uh, the Nissan answer, we expect Alex Buncombe, but um, if it's any different from that, I'm sure you'll let us know. And Nicola Armindo, that Jack has just mentioned in this BMW, is another man to watch. He's come from Porsche racing, both in terms of the One Make Championships and uh, Porsches in GT racing and at Le Mans. British GT, Blanc Pain, you name it, he's raced Porsches for years and years and years, and now he moves towards the BMW. So, John, he's, he's jumped ship. Um, I mean, don't ask me, don't, I mean, you know. <laughs> I mean, when Porsche get themselves into a position, and remember, Porsche are running their own championships, which is their focus, because they sell zillions of cars, mm. GT3s and vari variants, Super Cup cars, so that's their focus. But, you know, it's still a great race car, and I just wish we saw more Porsche, well, certainly more than we've got here this weekend. I think in fairness as well, Porsche is a bit concerned with its LMP1 project with Mark Webber, and maybe that's taken a lot of attention, and uh, the GT project will be given a bit more love next year, perhaps. Porsche has done this before when it had the LMP2 car. It kind of ignored the GT element, and then really went gung-ho on it again, and a lot more was sold, and a lot more titles came. So Porsche does these things in waves. So, it's also got a busy year supplying people the new cars for the One Mate Championships around the world, but that's something else to test its engineers. So Q3 is, Q3 is underway, and the next lap is going to be when we start to see anything like a, a proper lap time. There's number three with Christopher Meese at the wheel. We know Christopher is quick, former champion when he drove with Stefan Rotelli, so that's a potential winning car. 44 Aston Martin has ventured out now with Stephen Jelly at the wheel of it. Stephen, who came from single-seater racing into the British Touring Car Championship for a spell. He's raced in the Carrera Cup GB. We've seen him in McLarens, in Blancpain. Admittedly, not with perhaps the fastest of co-drivers. So it's going to be an interesting opportunity, I think, this for Stephen, who fits in very well at Motorbase, to show us how good he is for this year. Frederick Verviche, currently fastest in first sector, was currently fastest in first sector. Now that's changed. And we go to... It's the Nissan, in fact, has gone the quickest in that first section, so... I mean, it's all slightly irrelevant at the minute because everybody is out having the process of going in the right lap or they are at the beginning of their uh, first flying lap yeah. as the Nissan runs wide on the exit. Coming out of Lesmo 2, just ran onto that. Whether it's a little bit of natural hot grass, it's... it's uh, AstroTurf, AstroTurf thing. stuff yeah. that they stick down. The grass creek yep. is the other um, one. So let's look and see whether the descent can continue. Yeah, it's got fastest sector time and second sector as well. But as you say, it's his first flying lap, or anybody's first flying lap. It's Katsumasa Chio, the young Japanese, Chio-san, who is behind the wheel. And he has raced, as I think I was saying earlier on, in things like uh, Japanese GT, not the Super GT, not the most powerful of cars, but he comes over to Europe to learn about these circuits, and Lucas Ordonia goes to Japan as part of this Nissan driver development program, a driver exchange scheme to go and uh, race out there, and Europe gains Katsumasa Chio for the year, and uh, he's a very personable young man, he's very quick, and he weighs about four stone wet through, and he's here to learn, and he's here to show how fast he is, and at the moment he's doing a good job, he's set the gun time of 48.9. Yep, and the times are literally changing the positions, by the car coming across the pit straight. So 48.909 is the quickest time for the Nissan. The Ferrari, fastest in first sector. Let's look and see what they're going to expect from this. This has been a good car all day, hasn't it? Checking oh, by Petrobelli at the wheel. Petrobelli. So Petrobelli, absolute best, personal best in the sectors. Andy Suchek has done the absolute best in sector two, incidentally, in number 99 McLaren. Max Book has gone quickest to 48.949. I mean, as everybody puts in a lap time, things are going to change. So it's Book at the moment ahead of uh, Chio. Marco Seafried's green Ferrari has gone third. And here is Giacomo Petrobelli, who should get himself up to the point again. Now, Parent goes top, and Andy Suchek goes second. You can't get it out quick enough, can you? <laughs> I mean, literally, by the set, a 48.172 for Alvaro Parent. So that's close, as we have seen so far in this qualifying session to the best time we saw earlier in the day. Petrobelli third, top Ferrari, top in Pro-Am as well, a 48.680. So it's ART's McLaren's first and second. Parent ahead of Stuchek, third is Petrobelli, fourth is Book, fifth is Chio, and now sixth fastest, it is Thomas Enger. 
And it's all going to change on the next lap, although Alvaro Parent, McLaren factory driver, put into ART for this year, has done the absolute best once again in sector one. Danger is he might encounter traffic on this lap, which will not be good news. Well, all he can try and hope for is get a good draft coming out of Lesmo too, but the gap between himself and the Aston Martin is challenging. He's going to have to be very brave to think about a move down the inside up into the Ascari. The Aston goes very defensive. No, it backs off. It lets the McLaren go through. So and Alvaro Parent really has benefited very quick indeed into the first part of Ascari. He has done. Ooh, car dances around yeah. the second part of the corner. Absolute best in sector one. That has been bettered. He's done the absolute best in sector two. The other man that's really on a mission is Giacomo Petrobelli in the Ferrari, who has done an absolute and a personal best. It's the other way round now for Perez. So Perez should go quicker, but number 11 Ferrari at the end of this lap is a possible front row car as a prediction. This car is right on the knife edge. You can see going into the Parabolica, the tail was desperate to swap at the front. Comes across the start finish line. No, he it does. First yep. until 47. 47, 7, 9, 0. That's going to take some beating. Now, Giacomo Petrovelli in number 11 Ferrari is the next one to look for because he is third. He's done an absolute and a personal best. You're looking at the moment at Alvaro Parent. And uh, where is the Ferrari? Here is the Ferrari in the draft. It comes across the timing line, goes second. A 148-011. It's two tenths back, but Giacomo Petrovelli, who is an AM, don't forget, a quick AM, but an AM, goes second. And Thomas Enger, who we've hardly seen anything of, we know he's here. Thomas has gone fourth quickest, hardly had any time in the car, got held up a lot in that final, what do I call, pre-qualifying practice session last time because of incidents on the track. Harold, uh, Thomas Enger up to fourth. Duncan Tappy in his Bentley has just gone up to 31st, first flying lap. Stephen Kane has not yet done a lap time, so we haven't seen the best out of that car. 47 Ferrari hustling on, heading up towards the uh, timing line. Sorry, 41 Ferrari, I should say, hustling up towards the timing line. That's the Sport Garage car. There is Thomas Enger in the Lamborghini Gallardo, fourth. And more times shuffle as the cars come pounding over the line. Thomas Enger's next lap is not going to bode an improvement, I don't think, because he's down in sector one. Well, that's normally the incident of where you've seen a car on a new set of tyres. You get the one flying lap, you've got to make the best of it, and then every lap afterwards, tyre just goes into a stabilisation mode. As the Nissan rejoins, uh, coming down pit. Look how busy the racetrack is coming down into turn one. Greg Gilver, we got excited about wrongly in Q1. We can do it for real now. He's gone third. He's done a 48-416. So it is Alvaro Perez, Giacomo Petrobelli, Greg Gilver, Marco Seafried, Maximilian Buch, Andy Suchek as the top six. Our quickest change. Absolutely right. And factor this car in as well, 55 Audi which has got Andre Couto, the Macanese driver, winner of the Macau Grand Prix, the day of his life when he won that. As a no one's ever man. heard of him before or since, or since in reality, no. which is very unkind. Any driver that wins in Macau should be a driver worthy of being uh, mentioned. Absolutely. 17th, that car has just gone. Duncan Taffy into the top 10, and Stephen Kane 13th. Not what I'd expected, but it's maybe uh, a cautious, maybe a busy opening lap. So let's look and see what the number seven Bentley of Stephen Kane is going to do. He's, oh, runs wide coming out of the second Lesmo again. And that's Greg Gilver. We've talked about him going third. He's still on it, isn't he? He's still pressing on. We uh, have been talking already about how quick the young Frenchman is, former Peugeot Spider Cup champion. He's gone well in French GT as well as his sporadic block pan outings. Carl's a bit nervous dancing into the Ascari chicane. In the sectors, he was good in sector one. Now, we've had a change because Francesco Castellacci has gone up to third, second in Pro-Am, and also Lawrence Vantor, although he's only 17th, has done the best of anybody in the middle sector. There's more to come from Audi number one, I would predict. I would think Lawrence Vantor is going to look just for that one bit of clear racetrack to try and get a lap in. He knows what he can do, he knows the car has got the pace to do it. He just needs clear track all the way around. Now, what can Gilbert do two laps in a row? He was third, he's down to fourth, he breaks the beam and stays fourth. So he lost out in the last sector there. Castellacci in number 90 Ferrari, absolute best in sector one. Parent has just done the absolute best in sector two, but was a gnat slower in the first sector. But there is the car, Lawrence Van Four. But he's slower in sector one. Well, let's look and see if he can make up any of it. How much slower is a mute point? If he can't he get is. a purple in second and third sectors, then he's not going to be on that front row or on that coveted pole position. Alvaro Parent. He is a second slower in the first sector. Parent has gone faster again, a 47.603.
Well, Vantura's got work to do here. Castellacci, number 90 Ferrari, is the other one because he is absolutely flying. There he is. Third, there's a pro-am pole at stake as Stefan Ortelli and Edward Sandstrom watch how Greg Gilver is doing and he's improved in sector one. He's done a personal best. Every car is worth watching at the moment. How about that for a line out of the Escari chicane? That was commitment, but whether yeah. it was good or not in terms of lap time, I suspect there'll be tenths of seconds being lost there. Yeah, that's Van Tor pushing on, but he needs to get the full lap together, and I think he's hopefully going to do this at the end of the session when the track's a bit quieter. This is the first one of excitement now. Castellacci, absolute best sector one, a bit down in sector two, crosses the timing line at the end of sector three and stays third and improves the lap time of 48.310, but stays third overall. Disappointing for the Ferrari, they thought they might have had a chance at getting the pole position, but it looks like the McLaren has got it comfortably at the minute by, what, four-tenths of a second from the second-place Ferrari. Marco Seafried here being held up in traffic, lights are flashing. He is sixth and third in Pro-Am. It's, as we saw last year, very good for Ferrari, this. He finds the dirt on the outside of the road. He's going to get two more laps in if he needs them. Lawrence Vantor did improve, he went 15th. It was a sort of not great start, but a better middle and end to the lap. And again, in the first sector, he is no quicker. Now, Marco Seafried down to the chicane. Traffic's going to go against him here, I fear. ART are looking pretty chuffed with life, with Alvaro Parent at the top. Is that the Bentley up to, up to fourth place? It is, Stephen Kane. Excellent. Up to fourth. Excellent. 48.322. And Duncan Tappy is 12th, 48.6. There is the Bentley. That's what a Lesma won. Stephen Kane runs the car right and I mean lovely, lovely exit. All the energy is going forward, car not moving around unnecessarily. And a good speed from the second of the Lesmo so he can carry that all the way down under the banking. That's the bridge that actually carries the banking and then hard on the brakes for Ascari. Oh, aggressive, oh, oh, aggressive, oh, oh, oh. aggressive, and in trouble, in trouble. In the and wall. big time. Big time trouble for Stephen Kane. That happened just by being aggressive on the curb, entering into the Ascari, and the car went bounce, 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 and all of a sudden, the mass, the momentum just took that car, and that is a heavy impact. And Stephen Kane, well, he's going to drive it back. I don't know what he's going to do with it. I mean, it's principally body working, you can see, but now that's getting caught under the wheel, and that is a red flag. And that's Q3 over, a minute and 42 on the clock. Just watch this again. He's aggressive on the amount of curbing he takes, gets airborne, car then runs wide in the outside of the corner, catches the dirty bit, and Stephen knows this is inevitable, and he can do nothing about it. He's just trying to save it as best he can. And uh, heavy impact, bodywork damage primarily, uh, radiator probably as well, hopefully, and Antoine de Klerk looks at it and thinks, ooh. Malheureusement. Well, he is French and a yes. big... Oh, tout à Or words to that effect, yes. Uh, one stopping with them. Well, red flag, and with a minute and 42 seconds to go, which is less than a lap time, the session's over. Because even if they were to restart it, at the end of the outlap, the flag would be there, so what's the point of restarting it? So, Stephen Kane's Bentley, I'm afraid, is a very sorry mess. After all we've been saying and praising Stephen and the team, I'm afraid, he's had a big, big drama right at the very end. Session will not be resumed, it is over, it's confirmed on the timing screen. Alvaro Parent takes pole position. The thing I will say that Malcolm Wilson, who runs them sports uh, at Bentley programme, he'll be upset, a lot of extra work, hopefully the damage is superficial, but at least he had done it trying. He had put that car under the second row of the grid. Teams don't mind a little bit of additional work if they see they're getting the results. It's when the car is at the tail of the field, the driver's moaning, and uh, then they have an accident. But this, as much as it's a setback in terms of the preparation for the event tomorrow, well, Stephen, looking at it ain't going to help it get better. Get all the body work off the car, let's have a quick look around the radiator and all the suspension components. Again, it's that aggressive attack on the car. Mm. Remember, this is a very stiff car across the front, so if you are too aggressive like that, that's what happens. Hopefully, it looks worse than it is. Stephen Kane, four fastest, but now giving the M Sport mechanics a lot of work to do. But hey, they spent most of the early part of the year repairing Robert Kubis' rally cars each round, so yeah, this, this uh, is nothing. Uh, interesting enough, Malcolm Wilson mentioned that to me today. I mean, <laughs> I, how many shunts can one driver have? In a, in, he's had more shunts than he's had rallies this year. <laughs> Well, Stephen Kane will not be impressed with himself. He will be chuffed he's got the time out of the car. He's OK, which is the good news. 
and uh, he will go and do some explaining, but uh, hopefully the car will be on the grid, it should be on the grid for tomorrow. The uh, doctor comes over, Stephen says, I'm fine, and the doctor will decide for himself. Thank you very much. Interesting hands device mm. that Stephen Kane's using. It's, it's actually got a crisscross behind. It's not just simply attached to your helmet. That's a much more secure yeah. hands device than I've seen most drivers using so far. And he gets the crash helmet, he'll go to the medical centre, uh, as any driver will do in an incident, whether it's large or small, and Stephen says he's fine, the doctor will make sure that it's indeed the case once the adrenaline has worn off. Stephen gets a ride in the lovely Alfa Romeo Giulietta, at least, and he will... Still no, front-wheel drive, it's yeah, not I'm, a real Alfa. I know, I know, I know, John. I do apologise on behalf of Alfisti everywhere. So, Stephen hopefully will be good to go tomorrow from the second row of the grid. Drivers, in the meantime, make their way down the pit lane, back to the teams. The cars now go to Park Ferme. And let's have a look at how qualifying looks then. ART Grand Prix, thanks to Alvaro Parent, will start on pole position. Great effort by Giacomo Petrobelli for the Pro-Am pole ahead of the Francesco Casalacci car. Stephen Kane fourth before his off. Lawrence Vantor unnoticed because he did the time just before the flag. Uh, fifth ahead of Greg Gilver. Marco Seafried seventh. Franck Pereira's Porsche eighth. Ninth, Christopher Mies tenth. Max Book then Andy Suchek in 11th and uh, 12th, Thomas Enger. After that, Duncan Tappy from Steph Dusseldorp in Q3. Sonvico ahead of Andre Kuta. The Macanese was 16th. Uh, Katsumasa Chio, 17th, ahead of Fred Vervish. And Stephen Jelly, 19th. Nick Katzberg was 20th. Oli Bryant, 21st. Uh, then Nico Maroc, Andrea Simonson, and Stefano Colombo, regular here in Italian GT racing, 24th. After that, AF Corsa's Ferrari, 25th, in the hands of Francisco Guedes. Richard Abra in the Mark Poole owned Aston, 26th. Phil Quaves, McLaren, 27th. Nicola Armindo, when he got going, only got to 28th ahead of Loboda. Frank Schmickler, former DTM hero, Michel Albert. Alex Buncombe's turbo pipe woes behind him, 32nd from Romain Brandello, Julian Westwood, Freddie Kramer, and Mark Sword. 37th, the AF Corsa Ferrari of Howard Blank. And to round out the times, the reigning gentleman trophy champion, Jean Luc Bonchemin. So that's how it looks in Q3. One or two teams with work to do, but the happiest man in the place, I suspect, is Alvaro Parent. He has taken pole position for ART Grand Prix. Let's hear from him with Jack. Alvaro, great lap. McLaren's looking strong. Uh, definitely uh, two really good laps. Really happy for that. For the you know, ART, we had a good test uh, in the winter in Pan Ricard, and uh, coming here, you know, we did all, all the right steps, uh, put the car. Um, how I wanted and my teammates also uh, did two really good laps so that, that got them uh, correct there and you know the, the good ones and uh, managed to, to be on pole you know really really happy for uh, for all of us McLaren ART and myself Brilliant. congratulations thank you a class act Alvaro Parent in many ways it's a shame that he didn't go to Formula One in other ways good for us because We've been able to see him do so well in GT racing. Well, tomorrow's opening round of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series is going to be an absolutely great way to start the season. We blast off at 14.45. From Jack Nichols, John Watson and David Addison for now, goodbye.